Good afternoon, and welcome to the Concord Bookshop. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you here today, and we're happy to present uh, Gregory McGuire. Uh, Gregory is a local author, as well as being nationally and internationally famous, and uh, of that we're very, we're very, very proud. Um, today, Gregory will be reading from and discussing What in the Dickens. So with no further ado, it's Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. I love this store, and so it's a real pleasure uh, to be back here and to read a little bit and talk a little, little bit about this new novel published from Candlewick on September 11th, 2007. What the Dickens with a subtitle, The Story of a Rogue Tooth Fairy. Uh, there was some argument in Candlewick that said, perhaps the story of a rogue tooth fairy should be the title, and What the Dickens might be the subtitle. But What the Dickens, to me, as a subtitle, sounded too much like, what the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, no, let's leave this the way it was originally intended to be. Uh, this is, however, the story of a tooth fairy, now, there are some children in the room who may have had visitations from tooth fairies or may be expecting some in the near future. So I will, I will be gentle about what I say, um, but I will um, nonetheless be honest about what this book is about. And I will tell you how it came about. If for the last 25 years, I have spent a lot of time in, sto in uh, stores, I was going to say, in schools all over the United States talking to children about writing. This is how I began to do this. Schools would invite me to come in as a visiting author. I would get to the school and I would say to the school children, would anybody like to ask, an ask me any questions about my novel? And inevitably, no hands went up. Uh, so as somebody who needed to, to fill out the 40 <laughs> minutes that I wasn't supposed to be talking to school kids, I almost instantly decided if they're not going to ask me questions about my novel because they haven't read it, then I have to ask them questions. I have, to, I have to bring something to them. So right away, the very first day I became an author in the classroom, I became a teacher in the classroom, and I began to talk about how children learn to write, how people learn to write when they're children, and how I, as a, as a grown-up writer, had started writing when I was a child. My first stories weren't very good, they certainly weren't very long, but they were stories, and my career began when I was little, when I was about six or seven. I didn't sell anything for 15 years, but I began my apprenticeship when I was about in second or third grade. Now, in those years in which I was teaching kids about writing, I would sometimes come upon students, usually in middle school, who did not think that they had any creative juices in them at all. They thought if they had ever had any, it had already evaporated, and the force of their hormonal reconstruction was taking over, they were never going to be creative again. They, their minds were on other things. I had to work with kids like this. Sometimes they had to work six sessions in a row in the course of uh, a stint in a school. So one of my tricks to get kids who thought, I'm not the artistic type, Mr. McGuire, one of my tricks was to bring in a file of images that I had cut out from calendars and from newspapers, any place where I had a legitimate right to cut out an image. They were photographs, they were drawings, sometimes they were photocopies of pages from children's books that I'd liked, and there was a, a steady sheath, a solid sheath of maybe uh, maybe a hundred or two hundred images. I'd walk around the room with this envelope and I'd say, stick your hands in and pull two pictures out. Don't look at them, just pull them out. Whatever two pictures you get, I want you to write a little scene that involves both those images. Most often, they would be two characters. Every now and then, there'd be an object, like a seashell or, or a, a woods in the mist or something. Every now and then, there'd be an object or a setting. But most often, there'd be two characters. So the writing exercise, it wasn't write a story, because writing a whole story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, with a meaning and with some dramatic impact, is hard to do. It's hard to do even for grown-ups. But to write a little scene, that's not so hard. So, for instance, a seventh grade boy might pick out a picture of, you know, somebody playing the guitar at a rock concert and uh, a mouse in an apron sweeping 
uh, sweeping acorns off her front doorstep. And I'd say, write a scene in which those two characters come together and have to do with one another. Uh, I might pick the Wicked Witch of the West, say, favorite character of mine, and President Reagan, and say, <laughs> right, what happens when these two characters meet each other, you know, in the White House, you know, in the East Wing. Uh, I would often do the job myself, because I believe as a teacher, but unless you show your students you understand the nature and range of the assignment, you actually find it exciting yourself, then your students aren't necessarily going to trust you. This, of course, is because I was an itinerant teacher, and they had no reason to trust me in a short amount of time. So one day, I picked out uh, a picture of, of, of a, a fairy. It looked like maybe one of those flower fairy garden fairies, rather, rather overly souped up and feminine, uh, floating around in the ether. And I decided that I was going to the other picture I picked out was an old lady. And I thought, okay, what happens when these two characters meet? Well, now let me embroider it a little bit. One of the characters, the fairy, I won't make it be quite so simpery as it looks. This is going to be a tooth fairy. This is going to be a tooth fairy on an assignment. But tooth fairies, we know, come to children. What's this tooth fairy doing with this old lady? I looked at the old lady. It was just supposed to give me some ideas. I thought, the old lady is really old and she only has one natural tooth left in her head. <laughs> she already has surrendered all the rest of her teeth to Jesus. There's only one tooth left, and she doesn't want to let go. The tooth fairy wants the tooth, because that's what tooth fairies do. Give me that tooth! <laughs> the old lady is a bit confused, because she thinks the tooth fairy is the angel of death come to take her to heaven. And she's not quite sure how this little angel is going to carry her carcass you know, out the window and up to heaven. <laughs> So it was just a little episode of confusion. It lasted about a page. And when I was finished with it, I laughed. I mean, I laughed as I was writing it. And when I said, would anybody in the room like to read their story, I raised my own hand because I wanted <laughs> kids to fall on me. Uh, this was, again, to show them that, that the whole business of writing stories is the business of how to invest enthusiasm in your own ideas, how to pick ideas, indeed, that make you interested in what you're doing. So I read some of the kids' stories. I read my own story. I thought, I better save this. This might, this might develop into something after a while. I went back to my home and stuck the uh, one-page little writing exercise into a file folder called Story Ideas, which has maybe 50 or so little snaps and snippets of things that I've thought of over the last 30 years. Along came the Boston Globe about six, seven years ago, uh, and somebody called me up and said, would you like to provide us with roughly a 36-page story to run in six sections in the Boston Globe, a serialized story? I saw that this has been something that has been going on now, and I thought, sure, why not, especially if I can do it pretty quickly. I looked, at, I looked through my story idea file. I found the page with the old lady and the tooth fairy. And I thought, well, first I thought, what could you call it? And then I thought, the next thing that occurred to me was, you could call it the tooth fairy bites back. <laughs> and so, again, I started to laugh. I thought, that's a good title. If, if I can make myself laugh, if I can make myself interested, maybe there's a reason to spend time with this material. In the end, I didn't call it The Tooth Fairy Bites Back. Uh, I, I called it Gangster Teeth, I think. Uh, but it was a story about a tooth fairy who was separated from his tribe at birth and had to go about the world trying to figure out what to do with his instincts of stealing teeth when he didn't have the proper education or a good family background <coughs> to tell him how it was proper to be a tooth fairy in this world. The story ran for 36 pages, and I was happy enough with it. Flash forward, fa uh, fast forward, excuse me, about a year, and an editor at Candlewick Press in Cambridge met me at a cocktail party and said, do you have any stories you might sell uh, to Candlewick? And I said, sadly, because of other, you know, concerns and constraints on my, on my contracts at the moment, I'm not allowed to sell new material uh, to, to Candlewick. I have to sell it to another publisher because I'm, up, I'm obliged to do so. And canny lady that she is, she said, well, do you have any old stories that you could sell us? And I thought, well, there was that Boston Globe story. That's, you know, that's already been published someplace else, so it's pre-existing. It's just not a novel. So I sold it to Candlewick after I signed the contract. She called me into her office. She shut the door. She said, let's talk about this story. I said, all right. I really like the story. I'm glad you're going to publish it. She said, 
we're not going to publish it. <laughs> and I said, we just signed a contract. She said, no, we don't really want this story. We don't think this story is very good. <laughs> <laughs> we want the story that we think you can write out of this material. We want you to do the big, full-blooded Maguire treatment on this little 36-page story. This, it's nice enough, but it's anemic. We don't need it. So go back to the drawing board, will you? Now this, in, in legal terms, this is kind of bait and switch, but <laughs> nonetheless, I got in the car and I thought, she wants a big, fat children's fantasy. She wants the whole nine yards of the things that I have done for my adult novels, like Wicked and Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister. She wants the history, the lore, the, the civilization of two theories. She wants to know how the entire operation works, where it came from, what its aims and goals are, what problems it has, and how an individual works with, or perhaps is excused from working with the society of the tooth fairies. But I have to admit, that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I thought a tooth fairy story is kind of slight and ephemeral, and it's supposed to be over fast, because if you spend too much time thinking about it, you know, you might get bogged down in the detail. So I was struggling with myself, thinking, what, what can I do? Do I have to fulfill this contract? now that I know really what is wanted, and what can I do to fulfill it when I don't think in these dark times in which we live, the times after 2001, I don't really think I want to spend what is left of my creative years doing a big, dense fantasy about two theories. In other words, how can I make this story have some meaning to me? Well, not long after the contract obligation you know, was suggested to me, I was off on holiday. It was a year and a half ago. It was up in Maine, and it was we were up at a, on the, on the sea, sea coast in a house with a beautiful porch that overlooked um, Penobscot Bay. And it was the same week on holiday that Hurricane Katrina was hitting another seaport. And day after day, that we didn't have TV, we ran to get the New York Times and to look at the pictures in the newspaper and to read the stories of a disaster that just seemed to get worse and worse with every passing day. The parts of the Hurricane Katrina that startled me the most were the parts about people who had left their homes and had gone for safety into a gymnasium or a highway overpass or someplace only to find that the safety that was offered was not safe. And I began to think what can we give people when we cannot provide them with food, when we cannot provide them with the assurance of security, when we cannot provide them with the medicine that they need? What is there left to share to give people comfort when there isn't even food to eat? Is there anything that, is, that one can still share? In the weeks and months that followed Hurricane Katrina, we all shared a lot given whatever we had to give. One of the ways that I shared was to contribute a lot of books and money to help immediately to repair the uh, New Orleans Public Library, because one of the things that people need most in dark times is stories that can give them courage. Remembering this, remembering the stories that I thought children would need to help them rebuild their faith in their, in their world in Louisiana, reminded me of an occasion that happened about 10 years ago. No, it was more than that. It was, it was more than tw uh, almost 20 years ago, actually. I was in Nicaragua, and I was on a, I was a, a member of a, of a group called Witness for Peace. And the notion, perha perhaps naive, perhaps, but certainly well, well meant, was that American citizens would go down to war-torn areas of Nicaragua and try to be an American presence for peace in domestic village situations where neighbors were fighting with neighbors, some of them using guns that the, that the American government had provided. So we were trying to be a different American presence there, not military presence, but a presence of peace. As I say, it was, it was perhaps naive, but it was well meant. And one day, without giving too many details here because of uh, the audience, one day I was in a situation where some gunshots rang out and the door in the house I was in had to be closed, and the lights went off, and there was a fear that there was going to be a, a serious military attack on this village that could not defend itself. In the house in which I was staying, there was a widower, a, a minister, and his three children. 
I didn't speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Some days I feel I hardly speak English. <laughs> but when the gunshots rang out, the three children in the family came up, and I found them sort of lifting my elbows and nestling under my arms the way little chicks will under the wings of a hen. Now, I w I'm not very hen-like, I don't think, but there they were, and I thought, what can I do? I'm a, I'm a pacifist. I can't, I can't go out and, you know, kickbox who's ever shooting that gun out there in the street and scaring us all. I can't break down the back wall so we can run. We are here. What can I do? I did the only thing that I really know how to do, which was to tell stories. Even without Spanish, I just did it by by when my using my hands, I pretended I made one hand be a dog. <laughs> then the dog fell off the go, <laughs> and the kids laughed. They laughed even though they were scared. So putting that memory of trying to give children in fright, the only thing that I have to give them, which was the distraction of a little story, putting that memory together with the children in uh, New Orleans and the danger and fright that they suffered, especially during that first week, gave me, finally, the nexus or the surround story for, a, for a, an otherwise perhaps rather silly story about a tooth fairy. The story is called What the Dickens, and it starts on a very dark night. It intentionally starts a little bit like A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine Lengel, who, who just died a little while ago. It starts in a dark time. I don't say where the story is taking place. I never exactly say what is going on, but you can tell by the opening paragraph uh, that it's going to be a hard time in this book. Here's the opening paragraph. By evening, when the winds rose yet again, the power began to stutter at half strength and the sirens to fail. From those street lights whose bulbs hadn't been stoned, a tea-colored dusk settled in uncertain tides. It fell on the dirty militias of pack dogs, all bullying and foaming against one another, and on the palm fronds twitching in the storm gutter, and on the abandoned cars, and everything, everything was flattened, equalized in the gloom of half-life like the subjects in a Browning photograph in some antique photo album, only these times weren't antique. They were now. So that's the first paragraph of a story about a tooth fairy. You think, whoa, you know, <laughs> have I opened the wrong book? Does this book have the wrong cover? I mean, this is, this is a, little, well, a little eerie. It turns out that there are three kids in this story, and their parents have had to leave when the disaster has struck. They've had to leave because the medicine their mother needs has gone bad with a power outage, and they have to go very seriously to find fresh medicine for her immediately. They've left the kids with a 22-year-old uh, who is, as they might say now at Concord Carlisle High School, not particularly gifted in uh, life skills. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's cooked everything there is to cook. The rest of the food has rotted. He can't fix the generator. He's hopeless with a screwdriver. Uh, you know, playing the dulcimer for another hour is not going to keep those kids, you know, from screaming. So he does the only thing that's left. He begins to tell them a story on a dark night. And the story he begins to tell is the story of a tooth fairy who is born an orphan in a dark time. Now, if some of you know some of my children, some of you might recognize the description of this tooth fairy as one of my children. Uh, some of you might not. But, at any rate, I didn't realize the resemblance in the description until after it was written. Here's the first two paragraphs about the Tooth Fairy. To start with, he wasn't much to look at. I mean, literally. I mean, he was slight and small. I also mean, he blended in. His arm webs were filmy, nearly transparent, and his skin was suggestible, like water. I suppose his circulation worked on a capillary system. His coloring could shift from pale to dark and many shades in between. A limited talent for camouflage. Not enough to make himself invisible, nothing like that. But he wasn't much to look at even when you could see him right in front of you or when measured up against others of his kind. His head was flattened back and his nose was more beaky than perky. 
His hair flew everywhere, as if eager to get off of his scalp. His neck was a toothpick, his arms toothpick, his legs toothpicks, with big flattened feet. Most skibberine have slender feet that come to a point, like sharpened pencils, like ballet folk on their ballet toes. But our hero's feet were made for walking. I met him when I was ten. That's the story, really. But first I should tell you about where he came from. Then I go on in the story to tell a little bit about how he was born, how he didn't realize that most tooth, most tooth fairies are born in sort of clots of 60 or 70 or 80 at once. So they've got a lot of brothers and sisters right away. But somehow his little egg was detached from the harvest of tooth fairies, and he was born not, not just alone without brothers and sisters, but he was born outside of a society. So he had no idea that he wasn't the sole creature of his kind in the universe. He does go about, and I do rely on some of those early exercises, and indeed he blunders into the window of an octogenarian who is sitting up all night drinking gin. She's in the attic in her house, and he meets her, she sees him, she thinks she's having perhaps a delusion from, you know, too much gin, and he flits away, she leans her head back against the pillow. This is her talking. Where'd you go, she said suddenly. Invisible guest, where are you? He stayed as still as he could. You've gone, she concluded, sinking back against her pillow. Gone, gone. It was all my imagination. I was dreaming of companionship. Like in the old days, before I began to terrify my relatives with the force of my character. But they insist on sleeping all night long, every single night of the year. And what do they bring me for company? Nothing but books. She waved her cane in the air. The skibberee remembered his original goal. Looking about, he saw that the room was crowded with books. Books on the floor, books falling under the bed, books on the mantelpiece, books on the dresser, and on the seat of the rocker. They bring me presents. Fat comfort. Books. What good are books? Look at this tripe. She lunged for a paperback volume and whipped it open and stabbed a page with a bony finger. At 96 I had lived enough, that is all. This is supposed to cheer up an old sinner? I don't think so. It's all rubbish. Rubbish tied with a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor for crying out loud. She tossed the book aside. What the Dickens had to duck to avoid a concussion. Now, she doesn't care much for books. Not when books are intended to be the substitute for company. Really, we need both. We need company and we need books. Sometimes we need books as solace from the company that is enforced <laughs> upon us. Other, no, other times we need company as a respite from the books that are giving us something true that's hard to stomach. In the end, in this scene, she manages to capture the tooth fairy by taking her last glug of gin and putting the glass upside down over him. Her mm -hmm. eyeglasses are on the mantelpiece, so she can't see him very well. She's not sure what it is. Is it the angel of death? Is it a tooth fairy? Is it just a big moth? She's not sure. But she decides she's going to keep it forever as a pet. And maybe she can entice her grandchildren to come upstairs and visit her by telling her she's caught the angel of death. She decides that it should need to read, too. So she takes a book from her pile, and she puts it up next to the gin glass, and she's going to turn the page once a day so he can read. She doesn't know how fast he can read, but she figures once a day he can get through it. The book that she decides that he can read for the rest of his life in entrapment is 100 Years of Solitude, <laughs> which she thinks is appropriate. Eventually, though, he escapes, and he wanders into a room where he sees a child of the right age to deserve a visit from a tooth fairy. Here's a little scene from that. A pair of beds. In one, a grown-up snored underneath a forearm thrown over the face. In the other, a child breathed soundlessly. The bathroom light had been left on, and the door was open a few inches, so in a moment the room swam into focus. Next to the adult's bed was a magazine. The grown-up had been reading before sleep. What the Dickens checked to make sure that there wasn't a glass of gin on the bedside table. But no, just a ticking alarm clock. On the child's side of the table flopped an open coloring book and three rubbed-down crayons. 
What the Dickens flew closer. He was drawn to the coloring book. It showed scenes from Peter Pan. I don't know which, maybe the Disney version. I only heard about this later. Anyway, the page was open to a drawing of Tinkerbell. Busty, pouty, peeved, and the way she was dressed, in danger of catching a serious cold. She had wings, though to what the Dickens eye, they appeared inadequate to the task of hoisting her aloft. She looked as if she might be suffering from some lower back strain. Wow, said What the Dickens. He looked closer. Wow. Are you out of your cotton picking mind? He whipped around, half expecting to see Tinkerbell in the flesh. Instead, he came face to face with an enraged little firecracker of a creature. She was hovering off the bedside table with her own set of wings set on ratchet. His heart wanted to lift up society, someone he could talk to. But she looked pretty steamed. What the dickens? She said in a whisper that was more like a hiss. Pleased to meet you, he said. <laughs> they come to discuss a little bit. He finds out that she is a genuine tooth fairy and that there are other tooth fairies. And she's got a job to do. And she's supposed to be doing this particular job solo, thank you very much. So he better butt out. She's not sure where he's from. Is he a spy from another tooth fairy colony? Was he sent as an assistant without her being told? She's a little bit nervous, but she's a friendly type anyway, so she shows him how she can use her rack of her, her roll of dental floss as a kind of a lasso, and she impresses him with a lot of her skills. And then she says, I've got to do my job because I've got to get this tooth by myself in order to win my badge. So you can watch, but don't help. And since he had no other plans for the rest of his life, he followed her. She zipped to the doorway, but paused in midair waited for him to catch up. In a voice as faint as dust, she mouthed, Now remember, no butting in. I need this one for my record. Bad. He looked again at the beds. The small human was a girl, sweet in her sleep, smelling like warm ginger snaps. Her head had fallen down the slope of a pillow, rucking up one corner of it. On the flowery sheet, beneath the corner of the pillow, a single pearly tooth lay exposed. It's all in the timing, whispered Pepper. Hang back, kiddo. Watch a pro at work. She rose an inch or two higher to launch into a dive, and what the Dickens twiddled his fingers in anxiety. If his flying was like that of an airborne toad, Pepper's was more like the dance of a hummingbird. In the glowing blue of the pre-dawn room, Pepper glowed a complimentary mauve. She looked no more substantial than the exhalation of breath from a sleeping child. She made landfall on the cresting seam of the pillow and lightly ran along its ridge top. Then, using her wings as baffles to slow her descent, she slid down the steep cotton cliff side and approached the tooth. The child snuffled and rolled over. The pillow lowered upon the tooth, covering it. Pepper, that's her name, Pepper wasn't fussed. From her shoulder, she unhitched the coil of white thread. Once she got it twirling, she sent the looped end sailing toward the top corner of the pillow. She lassoed the peak of the pillow and pulled tightly on the cord. Then, when the nut was secure, she flew backwards so she could sling the cord around the bedpost. He was slack-jawed in admiration. She was able to use the cord and the bedpost as a pivot and hoist. Hand over little hand, she pulled out the cord and the pillow slowly lifted in the air, revealing the hidden tooth. Should I grab it? He wondered. But Pepper had told him to stay well out of it, and in deference to his new friend, he decided to obey her. She worried the tooth forward with her foot, <laughs> and then she gripped the cord in her mouth. Both hands now free, she opened the flap of the knapsack she wore on her back. She extracted something, a silvery disc of some sort, worked over with symbols and numbers and letters. Pepper slid this under the pillow, where the tooth had been. Hand under hand, she returned the pillow to its supine position. A magnificent showing. A triumph, he thought. Then he stuffed his fist in his mouth to keep from crying out. The alarm clock on the bedside table had started to hop and jangle like a box full of killer bees. I will leave you there, except maybe one little, little bit. The last bit I'll read today. 
Pepper entices What the Dickens to come back with her to the colony of tooth fairies. And I will tell you something, even if you decide not to read this book, you deserve to know this, a little bit of information. Do you know where tooth fairies have their little cities? It was, it was sort of hard when the world is getting so overdeveloped. There's so little space left for tooth fairy colonies that humankind isn't you know, about to bulldoze. So what they've decided since the 1950s, since the Heisenhower era, they have mostly located their colonies in the clover leaves of highway systems because the fast-moving traffic around, that, around those clover leaves keeps predators away and lots of interesting and useful grasses and trees and scrub brush grows up in the middle and they're almost always safe there. So that's where they live. And I don't know where the nearest clover leaf is here, <laughs> probably before 95, so they've got some terrain. But that's where they live and that's where Pepper brings what the Dickens back. But a tooth fairy colony like many establishments of creatures, is a little bit suspicious of newcomers. So in a scene that, uh, you know, is, is perhaps a little bit more like um, Homeland Security than perhaps we might like, <laughs> he is given some scrutiny by the stump mistress, whose name is Old Flossie. He's brought into a room and told he can, he can rest up, wash up, and have a nap there. Tired but not despondent, he sat cross-legged on the floor and lowered his chin in his hands. He thought about Pepper and hoped she wouldn't get in trouble for bringing him here. Trouble was the last thing he had ever meant to make. Make good, maybe. Make believe, yes. He wanted to make himself believe in something, but make trouble? Never. Suddenly a hot storm of light flooded the chamber from above. The whole ceiling was burning white, too bright to look at. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Invisible cords pulled the drapes of ivy back. On all the walls behind the ivy, even paneling the door through which he'd come, the silvery glint of mirrors screamed at him, showed him the truth. Not one lost twin, as he'd once believed. He saw a reflection of himself once and thought it was his twin. But several images of sad, sorry, what the dickens, with his raked up hair and his pretty wings with their useless, diamonding lights. Who are you? brayed a voice from somewhere. What the dickens, if you please? <laughs> he answered. Who are you? the voice repeated. What the dickens? <laughs> he answered back, roaring a little, in case the invisible questioner was hard of hearing. Then he answered the same question five more times in a row, even though the voice got louder and louder, as if it thought it could scare a different answer out of him. But there was no other answer, not that he knew of. What is your colony? The interviewer bellowed. I have no colony, I have no colony, I have no colony, he answered to save the loud inquisitor a little time and breath. <laughs> Where are you from? Beyond somewhere. It hasn't got a name, as far as I know. Who are your friends? This one was harder. A bird and her babies? A proud white cat named McCavity? A Bengal tiger called Maharaja? That's about it. He didn't think he could count as a friend the foul old woman who had trapped him in a gin glass. <laughs> what are you doing here? This was the hardest question of all. I followed Pepper because she said, let's go home. I was trying to see if this was home. For the first time he began to lose his nerve a little. Maybe I was wrong. Do you have to be so loud? What are you doing here? hoping to get a little rest and make a home for myself with my own kind. What are you doing here? The more often he heard this question, the less he was sure of the right answer. Breathing? Waiting? Being scared? Watching myself in the mirror? What are you doing here? I don't know, he had, what are you doing here? <laughs> and that's what I'll stop. <laughs> We have a little time for questions, I think. If anyone would like to ask questions, uh, I'd just as soon start with what the Dickens questions, if there are any, although I'm happy to talk about uh, my other books, some of which you might know, uh, yeah, if that should come up. But any questions? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, just a brief history on how Wicked got to Broadway, and what did you think of the final product? 
the question is a brief history about about how Wicked got to Broadway and what did I think of the final product. Wicked had a very different sort of start than What the Dickens, but like What the Dickens, it had a start that had several different stages. And when it was first published, it had uh, it had an immediate flurry of interest from Hollywood and four years of efforts at writing Hollywood scripts, none of which were very good. But in the course of that uh, in the course of that effort, the composer Stephen Schwartz, who had written Godspell and Pippin, uh, was handed the book by the folk singer Holly Near, who had been reading it. He read about a hundred pages and thought this was my comeback to Broadway, and made uh, inquiries immediately. He convinced me. Uh, that it would make a good play, and I decided on my own instincts not to ask for creative oversight. I said I will, I will, I would like to vet and approve the, you know, the hiring of the composer, the lyricist, the librettist, and the director. But once I have approved them, I am going to stand like a grandfather, having a smoke in the back room, while the creative people who are used to the theater world do their work. <coughs> So that's how it came to be, and what do I think of it? I admire it hugely. It's a very different story when you when you t plot it incident by incident than my novel is, but the morals are the same, and the ideas are the same, and what one comes out of the theater with is much like what I wanted one to be left with when one closes the back cover of the book, which is the sense that we need to take care, all of us, about how quickly we, we uh, demonize people in order to legitimize our actions against them. So, yes, please. Could you just ask, let me know what age group you think what the Dickens is appropriate for? Well, I think it's published for 9 to 13, and there were some kids in the room. You're a nine year old. You didn't fall asleep, did you? Of course, you know, your mother works in Candlewick, so you could be in a lot of trouble if you did. Uh, I think it's published for 9 to 13, but interestingly, uh, I know some bookstores have uh, positioned it right on the front table with other adult fiction, and in the first uh, in the first six weeks of publication, it has you've been bought a lot by my adult fiction readers, who I suppose think I have done for a story about tooth fairies what I had been asked to do. So it's a crossover book. I mean, there are a few people who manage crossover books like like somebody you may have heard of, J.K. Rowling, Rowling, <laughs> but her books are bought by a wide audience, and, and increasingly, um, everybody's relaxing about this. Adults are buying books that are published by children's book presses, and children have always scarfed up those adult books that have caught their attention. Uh, it doesn't matter what the adults say. They'll, if they find them, uh, they'll have them. So 9 to 13 is the reading level that I aimed for, but, and, but I hoped that an adult audience also would be able to enjoy those, uh, those references that were meant to remind them of the world in which we live now. And there's a reason why, of course, the book came out on September 11th. And, and as you garnered from <coughs> Gregory reading aloud, it's a, it makes a great family read aloud. Oh, so, you know, I think all members of the family can enjoy it and can read it aloud to a broad range of kids to, right. for the whole family. Right. The story does go back and forth between the, the internal story of the Tooth Fairy, who, even though it's even though he's a, a kind of a silly character, does indeed have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of danger and you, we might say trauma uh, to deal with, and and then the story keeps pulling back from time to time on uh, the story of the three children mm -hmm. in the storm, with the missing parents and the rather feckless, you know, adolescent slash adult who's trying to take care of them. It was interesting that that. Madeline Lengel has just died, uh, and I was very sorry about that because she was, in a distant way, a kind of a friend of mine. Uh, and with her book, A Wrinkle in Time, which was one of my favorite books when I was about 10, she, like, like our own Jane Langton here in Concord, was one of the writers who, uh, who's welcome into their, into their rich worlds, inspired in me the interest in fantasy and the hope that I might too be able to write fantasy. What the Dickens is stuffed with, with quotations, some of them uh, referred to, but most of them sewn in the, t in the text for knowing adults to enjoy hearing. But the first one that's mentioned is actually from Madeline Lengel. The kid, the, 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 I, I call him a kid because he's 22, 
Um, so to me, he's a, he's a kid. I mean, the back of his skull hasn't firmed up yet. Uh, uh, but he, at one point, he says on page nine, it's the very first literary quote in the entire book, which has about 40 of them. And uh, he's, he's trying to talk to the kids in any way to calm them down. And he says, wild nights are my glory. Who said that? Dinah couldn't answer. And Zeke only knew scripture verses. Mrs. What's it? Gage answered his own quiz. A wrinkle in time. Never read it, said Zeke in a definitive tone, meaning, and most likely won't. <laughs> um, so I was sorry you know, that Madeline died just before the book was out, so I could have sent it to her and said, here, you know, 45 years later, it's a story that also opens in a story, I and mean, it's an intentional homage, you know, to your great master work, and yours is the first literary quote that gets put in here as a way of my signaling, you know, very openly, that the pool of work that we read as children and adults becomes the common tongue that we all share. Sometimes people raise their hands at, at sessions like this and say, why would you bother as an adult writer, or as a writer for children, why would you bother to, to dip into the lore of childhood in order to tell stories for adults or for the crossover audience, for children too? And one of the answers I've become very comfortable saying is that the material that we get in childhood, by this point in our, in our fragmented culture, sometimes ends up being the only thing that people on different sides of the political aisle, on different sides of the economic scale, still share in common. The, the, the stories of childhood are one of our last remaining connecting tissues. And so I, I, I use those stories because I want to try to speak to everybody, not just to people with my educational background or people you know, with my skin color or my race or living on the, on the, on the fringe of the, of the country, uh, both politically and you know, geographically. Um, I'm interested in the story within a story uh -huh. like, uh, ratio. Is it more the, the children and their caretaker or the story of what the Dickens and your literary quotations are they only in the exterior story or are they no they're they're they're, they're sort of all they're sort of all the way through but they're they're very rarely identified the way this one was mm -hmm. this one was identified at the first just to kind of give a clue to the adult reader that they would Look if, if they looked out you realize that of course it the 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 22 year old who's the one who brought up the idea of quotations in the first page is the one who is telling the what the Dickens story. It's his voice that we're hearing. So if he's prone to quotations, then he's going to slip things in, you know, all the way through, and he's not going to identify them. So you don't see them. You just if you're if you're you know faster than a speeding bullet, you know you'll hear that in your own with, from your own background, and you'll know where he's getting that. Mm -hmm. He's just picking something in the common tongue and stuffing it in. I say the proportion is about three quarters Tooth Fairy story to one quarter quarter storm story, or maybe even more, maybe even it's four-fifths, one-fifths. Mm -hmm. The one quarter, big, partly because the storm story is so Perfect. scary, oh, I leave oh, it, okay. I leave it, in so little, just in small, in bit, small chunks. Yeah. Well. Question? Um, where, where did you get the idea to name the, fa the fairy and the title, what the day? Well, so that's a very good question. The question is, where did I get the idea to name the story and to name the fairy, what the Dickens? Now, I don't, do you like to write? Well, here's a little clue for you. Sometimes if I don't know the answer to a question like that, like what is my character going to be, I will actually write down the question with, with my hands. I'll write it down. Like, what is this character's name? Sometimes the act of writing it down will sort of trick me into supplying the answer, even if I don't know how. Or sometimes when I'm going to sleep, I'll say, I don't know what that tooth fairy's name could be. It used to be called change, but... I don't want that, you know, I, 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 I want something else for that, you know, now. That was okay for a short story, but for a big story, it has to be something more serious. And something that says the idea of the whole book, you know, more seriously. Uh, so, sometimes I will ask myself a question, go to sleep, and when I wake up, I find that my dream mind has kind of supplied me with the answer during the night. I'll ask myself the question again in the morning, and I'll know the answer. It's really interesting. But in this case, I was at a conference, and like... Many people going to conferences, I don't know if any of you go to conferences, but the main reason you go to conferences is to zone out when people are speaking at the podium <laughs> and do work on the side of your page and find and, and sort of, you know, let your mind wander and it's very productive. 
and I was sitting on the floor at this conference because there weren't enough seats. It was on a subject I cared about, but I still, my mind began to wander the way one does, and I started thinking, I just need a new name for this character. And I wrote down, oh, why can't I think, why can't I think of the, this name? What could his name be? What the dickens is his name? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and I read what I wrote. What the dickens is his name? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> what the dickens is great because it's a name like a question. And it's also a name that is, I didn't find, know this till later, it's a quote from Shakespeare. Shakespeare was the first person to say, what the dickens. And also, it incorporates in it the name of one of the greatest storytellers of the 19th century, Dickens. So in three different ways, it was a perfect name, what the dickens. <laughs> and so I was very happy. Once. But I had to ask myself, what the dickens is his name? Question mark. Oh, all I need to do is raise the question mark. <laughs> and then I knew it. So that conference was worth the, you know, the, the tuition. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about um, the creative process when your publisher asked you to rewrite it according to the way they visualize it. <coughs> How exactly does that work with a writer? The question is, is, when the publisher asks a writer to rewrite it according to the concept that they have in mind, uh, how does it work? for the writer. Well, if one has taken a vow of nonviolence, then one <laughs> resists throwing the editor out the fifth story window, which is, you know, one thing that occurred to me. Uh, I have learned, uh, it's, it's useful to be halfway, I hope halfway through my career, I hope not at the very end, but it's useful to have had many years of, of having had my ego bruised and battered by people who had different opinions than I do. Most often the opinions were right. Once in a while they weren't, and I stood my ground. But I have learned now not to take it personally when an editor says, this isn't working for me. I have learned to put my ego in a separate compartment and just listen like, you know, like, like a professional person. Uh, I didn't always know how to do this. I used to, I used to weep copiously if somebody would say, <laughs> I thought chapter two was too long. You know, it was only, you know, 320 pages. I don't know what they were talking about. Uh, so do but they give you creative direction? They, what they do is they ask, I, it, almost the, the best editors ask creative questions. And they might even phrase it in a question. Like, you know, what the dickens is the name? Might say, I, I felt like I didn't understand enough about why the tooth fairies live in a colony. Why aren't they all independent agents? You know, she didn't say, you must tell us. She just said, this is what I felt. I felt like I was missing something here. And sometimes you might supply exactly what she was missing, or other times you might go back and you might deconstruct the question. What I think the editor really meant was that there was a hollowness in terms of the authority chain of command. And that's, that's what I think a question actually means, and that's what I think is missing in the book. So I'll go back and fill in that chunk. And I'll hand the book back in, and very often the editor will have forgotten the questions she asked. She'll, she'll say, oh, it's really much better now, and I will have supplied the needs somehow. So there's a way in which one has to be very relaxed and not to take personally uh, what an editor says. On the other hand, sometimes you have to stand your ground. After Wicked came out and was, and was so popular, the, uh, I mean, immediately before the play came out, it, it sold very well. The next book I was writing was called Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, which sounds like and can be read a little bit like a fantasy, but was but it's not a fantasy. It's an historical novel with no fantastic, no real fantastic elements in it. Some fanciful characters, but everything in it is based on things that could happen in history or did happen in history. My editor said, "I want you to put in some magic characters, put in some imps, put in some sprites," and I said, "No, this is Holland." Holland in the 17th century. They didn't. They were. It's the center of rationality. They didn't believe in imps and sprites. When's the last time you went to the library and, and got out a book called Dutch Fairy Tales? <laughs> I mean, you know, the Dutch don't believe in fairy tales. I, I, in order to even use that, I had to. I had to Im, Im, import my main characters from England, because the English believed more in, in the, the world of the little folk. This is an historical novel, and I'm not changing it. I made the lead character a little bit more fanciful, so as an English girl, she kept wondering if there were imps or fairy godmothers running around. But in fact, it's, it did not turn into a fantasy. Some readers never noticed that, but it's not a fantasy, it's an historical novel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a, that's a way of just declaring every now and then you have to hold your ground. Right. Say, and this how is often do you rewrite um, something to find that common ground with the publisher and you? Well, I, I'd say by the time my books go to 
an editor, they are pretty clean. I don't say they're publishable, but they're pretty clean. I write cleanly, and I work on them, you know, probably for two or three drafts of my own before I send them in. And then it's very often two or three drafts afterwards. And by a draft, I, you know, sometimes can be just editing, you know, not, not adding. I rarely reshape a whole story. Uh, the work that I did on What the Dickens, thanks to the Candlebook editor who bought a 36-page story and ended up getting a 300-page story, that's a considerable edit. <laughs> <laughs> that's the biggest edit I've ever done. Maybe. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Would it be giving too much away mm -hmm. to tell us all uh, what the tooth fairies or the skibberine do with the teeth and what and how that relates to wishing? And hoping? Okay. Well, the question is, what do the tooth fairies do with the teeth? I don't know if any of you know what tooth fairies do with teeth. I've told you. If you, yeah, if you don't want to go there, <laughs> you can all blank your ears, as we used to say when I was little. This was one of the questions I had to deal with myself, because when you, when you start working with commonly held material, you think, well, what are the questions I always had as a kid? I know I get the quarter, or the nickel, or, you know, now, you know, government bond, or whatever it is that people <laughs> are slipping under the pillow. But what do they do, you know, where, does, where do the tooth fairies get the money, and what do they do with the teeth? I just happened, after the book had all been written, I happened to hear a wonderful NPR piece about tooth fairies. And it was like This American Life, or a show like that, maybe it was This American Life, and a guy was going around with a microphone, you know, putting it in the, in the faces of kids and asking questions, and he asked one kid, what do you think tooth fairies do with the teeth? And the, the kid said, they build their castles at them. <laughs> and the, 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 the adults said, well, build their castles with teeth? You know, that seems like a weird thing to do. Why don't they build their castles with bricks or something? And the kid said, because people don't have brick teeth. There's <laughs> 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 a, wonder, a wonderful example of the kind of circular logic with which you know, children deal with the mystery. Um, but nonetheless, it was a question, what do, why do the tooth fairies work so hard? Why do they put themselves in such danger to get children's teeth? What do they do with them? I had to, I had to figure this out for myself. So, what I decided, what I have discovered that they do, is they take, they take them back to their colonies. They hoard them until the night of the full moon. Once a month, they plant them on the night of a full moon, and on the course, during the course of a single full moon night, the, tooth, the, the teeth in the ground grow and produce birthday candles. Oh. Kind of little candles about this big that go on birthday cakes. Mm -hmm. And these are candles that really can give a birthday wish. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've had a birthday cake before and you've made a wish, I wish I could have a horse in the backyard <laughs> right now, <laughs> <laughs> and it hasn't come true. It's probably because the candle that was in your cake was not one of the tooth fairy candles. So there's some tooth fairies who have to collect the teeth. There are other tooth fairies who have to guard the teeth. There are some tooth fairies who have to plant and harvest the teeth. And there are other tooth fairies who have to deliver the candles into the pantries and dining room closets, and sometimes even in, in big cities, they actually go to candle factories, and they substitute real wishing candles every now and then in a box of ordinary candles. So sometimes, when you have a birthday, you just might get a birthday wish, because that candle came from a tooth, of the tooth fairy. <laughs> and the reason for this, as, as it was suggested, is that the ability to hope that a wish might come true is part of how we repair our world. The ability to hope that the next time there's a big storm in New Orleans, we might do better. The ability really to believe that that could be true. The, ab the ability to hope that you could put yourself in danger on behalf of suffering children and maybe stop the bullets from flying for just a day the ability to imagine that the world could be better than it is is born, I believe, out of the child's ability to make wishes. Making wishes is a practice to strengthen the imagination so that we can use the imagination to correct our world. That's my belief, and that's what, what the Dickens is about. So, thank you for the question, and thank you for all the questions.